Education. I'm very happy to have uh, our guest panel speakers today um, coming from uh, different parts of New York State as well as Kentucky. Just, just to reiterate, we are continuing with our webinar series and with the fall semester already in full swing, we felt it was most appropriate to have an academic educational uh, focus in the geospatial technologies. So I'm very happy to have our three, our next three speakers who will be able to provide their own intros in a short while. Uh, just to uh, mention, we have Dr. Jane Reed, Dr. Hung Myan Gang, and uh, Mr. Vince Denoto. Uh, we will uh, go through our each individual intro as well as uh, uh, PowerPoint that they have presented, short PowerPoints to discuss, as well as covering two topics that seem to be at the forefront of geospatial technology in today's academic world. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the, the first intro to Dr. Jane Reed to give her, give her own personal intro, about one to two minutes, and then we'll go to the next uh, presenter to speak on herself. Please, uh, Dr. Jane Reed. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to talk here. Um, so I'm Jane Reed. Um, I've been at Syracuse University in the geography department uh, for 19 years now. Uh, I specialize in GIS and remote sensing. Um, I teach about GIS and remote sensing, and I use those technologies to try to understand land use and how to change it, so human environment interaction. Um, so I've been teaching since 99, and I've seen a lot of changes ever since um, I've been teaching, and I teach at both the undergrad and the graduate level. Um, and I've recently developed some different courses, not just your standard GIS and remote sensing, but also um, a, a course on spatial storytelling, which is really thinking about how we can tell stories using spatial ideas, which includes maps, but also other um, ways of, of, of visualizing stories. Um, and then the other course I thought was very different that I recently developed is on UAV, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, and, and, and that's basically a, a, a result of the, the changing technologies that we're seeing um, at the moment. Um, and I've just finished four years as undergraduate director in the geography program um, at Syracuse University. So I've spent a lot of time advising undergrads, um, and a lot of our undergrads are actually coming out of our program with GIS and remote sensing, spatial skills, cartography skills, um, and wanting to know what kind of jobs they can do. So we're constantly thinking about, um, you know, how can we make our students marketable. Um, and part of that is the two topics that we're going to be actually talking about, um, the interdisciplinary approach. I think it's becoming really more important now that we give our students a real interdisciplinary base, and we'll be talking more about that, um, but also giving them some real world application, real world experience so that they can actually get to grips with and be useful in the marketplace. So I think I've taken my last two minutes there, um, so let's turn over to the next person. Jane, and um, just just a reminder, anyone that's not speaking, just uh, mute your audio just so we could uh, lessen the feedback that we're experiencing. And uh, with that, we'll turn that over to Hung Myung Gang. Uh, Dr. Hung Myung Gang, please uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the New York State GIS Association for this opportunity to present um, the GIS programs in uh, our department and also my research. Um, I've been working and teaching and researching in the Department of Geography at Hunter College of City New York in New York for 20 years. Um, I'm actually an urban geographer, but I've been using GIS a lot in urban settings, especially in transportation. So today um, I'll be able to uh, briefly present the GIS programs. Uh, 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 in the geography department at Hunter College, and mostly about my research. Um, I've been working with um, computer scientists, civil engineers, uh, public health uh, professionals uh, to use GIS, particularly uh, GPS, um, and 
also combine that with smartphone cloud computing and uh, use it to detect um, transportation mode. And then from there, uh, we are able to provide information about uh, uh, health information and environmental in information associated with uh, people's commuting to work and school. And so um, uh, I'll be able to present and show you some slides later on. Again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hong Young. Uh, and without uh, our last uh, panel, uh, last but not least, certainly, uh, Vince Donato, please. Thank you. Um, I'm privileged to be part of this um, seminar because obviously I am in Louisville, Kentucky, and I actually hold the same type of position that Razzie does. I'm the professional development chair for the Kentucky Association of Mapping Professionals, as well as the director of the National Geospatial Technology Center of Excellence, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. I'm actually a physicist by background, and so I take maybe bring a different approach into looking at geospatial technology than if I was a geographer from my academic background, even though I have graduate level work in geography and GIS. Before it was called GIS, actually, I'm going to age myself a little bit here. Um, but one of the things that I've worked most of my career on, both when I was teaching physics and now that I teach geospatial technology, is making sure that I bring contextual examples into my classroom. And by that, it requires me most times have another subject area. For example, when we um, map Civil War battlefields, we have to understand the battle. You don't just want to take a paper copy of the map and use that and not have a full understanding of what the battlefield is about. Also, it's going to be an understanding of society. And so, one of the case studies that I'll talk a little bit about later on is in looking at those who are registered on the security list. So we require the students to actually go out and find the list themselves, geoposition those people, and then actually research the law so they understand what the law is and decide to keep the law in compliance and not in compliance. So try to bring some technical real world examples in if you are looking towards an associate degree or a certificate in geospatial technology. Thank you. We just lost our moderator. We lost that. Jane, do you want to start? Yeah, I guess. Well, I'm thinking. Oh. Sorry, sorry go. about that. <laughs> um, technology, right? I think we'll get started. We'll get started with uh, our first topic. So I think the, the approach that we wanted to uh, take is to have two topics uh, for each of our speakers to cover. Um, and for the first topic is sort of the inter interdisciplinary approach uh, that each of our educators have taken uh, and have experienced throughout the years uh, within each of their departments and. Uh, within their curriculum development um, and just experience as educators. So it's an open discussion for each uh, uh, each presenter to go through. And you know, for any of our audience members or our webinar attendees, if you have other questions, please please, please uh, feel free to send in those questions, and we'll have that uh, addressed during our open discussion Q and A. Uh, portion where a few of our presenters will be able to provide their slides and presentation to go into a little more detail of what they want to cover, as well as answer your questions. So without uh, further ado, uh, we'll start with Dr. Jane Reed to provide us sort of a interdisciplinary approach that she's taken. Okay. All right. Well, I hope everybody can hear. I see that people are saying that the sound is going in and out. So I really hope um, that you guys can hear me. Write in the chat if you can't hear me, and I'll try to keep an eye on it. Um, okay, so interdisciplinary approaches, I, it's hard to know where to really focus, but um, I, so I'll, I'll just speak from sort of the Syracuse University experience that we have with our geography department. 
And we're a fairly small geography department, um, but we are the place where we do the geospatial technology. GIS is taught in the, our department, the remote sensing is taught in our department. There's some taught over in the earth science department a little bit. Um, but beyond that, in, uh, maybe the old class around campus might have a little bit, um, maybe a GIS within a policy class or um, things like that. Um, but, you know, if people want to learn GIS, they're going to come to the geography department. Um, and so what it sort of come, falls on us to figure out how we're supposed to be changing our curriculum, and how we're supposed to be responding to all the changes that are happening. And so right now, you know, everybody has a cell phone, everybody's using Google Maps. We've got digital globes all over the place. Um, UAVs are creating new and new and different types of Earth data about the Earth. Um, Earth satellite imaging is just producing amazing amounts of information about the world. Um, and all of it, it falls down to sort of being spatial and technological. So, um, you know, part of what we've been doing is trying to respond and constantly changing our classes. Um, trying to keep bringing in the new, um, you know, the new ideas um, that we need to be thinking about. Um, but in, in some, you know, in, especially in small departments, it becomes hard to be able to cover absolutely everything because there are so many different applications of GIS now. Um, and so, what we're trying to do at SU is really think about a more interdisciplinary approach um, and, and sort of trying to sort of think about what other departments are doing and reaching out to other departments for skills that we might not have the time to teach, whether we can or not. So one thing in particular that um, has really come to the fore is um, the idea of uh, data science. And data science sits traditionally maybe in math, maybe in engineering, maybe in information studies. Um, but it's never fallen in um, geography departments where we, we deal with spatial data. Um, but there is something called spatial data science, we believe. Um, and so we've, we've been trying to reach out to actually where they do data science on the SU campus, which is um, in the information School of Information Studies, um, and trying to reach out across um, colleges, basically, to see, OK, do they do programming that we don't have time to teach? Are they teaching project management that we don't have time to teach? Are they dealing with big data? Um, and if we can reach out and sort of share those skill sets across colleges, then it means that we don't have to do quite so much. Um, we're hoping, actually, that we can now start to develop some uh, joint um, programs, maybe certificate programs, either at the graduate level or the undergraduate level, maybe some joint minors, where you can sort of reach across those colleges and tap into the different um, skill sets that our students are going to need when they get out into the workplace. Um, basically, geography departments, we can't teach it all. Um, and so, so we've got to figure out how we can make it work and still have students coming out um, and being productive. So I don't know how long I can put that into disciplinary approaches. That's one example. Um, of where we're at SU is trying to really sort of reach out and, and think about across disciplines. Sadie? Dr. Hangmian, please uh, uh, give us your, uh, your discussion on uh, inter interdisciplinary approach. Could you show my presentation? I have a snapshot of our program. This is Vincent's presentation. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, my presentation. So um, here um, is the first slide. Um, I'm with the Department of Geography Hunter College and also the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, this is a, a slide I put in to show the GIS program we have and other programs we have in Department of Geography. So if you see here a drop down list, we have a GIS certificate program. Um, the program has been there for many years 
and basically uh, uh, someone who either is a, a part-time or a full-time student or a professional working in New York State come and take classes. And when they have taken 15 credits of uh, GIS related classes, they can get a GIS certificate. And then um, last year, we started a new master program in geoinformatics, uh, which uh, requires uh, either 33 credits plus a thesis or 70, uh, 37 credits uh, with the exam option uh, to get a master degree in geoinformatics. Uh, we uh, explore the uh, possibility of using an internship uh, to replace the exam in the future. Anyway, so um, other than this, we have a master degree in um, uh, geography and some other master programs you can see uh, on the list. And we, we are also associated with the PhD program in Earth and Environmental Sciences in the Graduate School of uh, City University in New York. So we have uh, both undergrad, uh, master, and PhD students in the department. Uh, we basically provide uh, the uh, introductory GIS courses to all the um, disciplines uh, in CUNY and also outside uh, um, in Hunter College and outside of Hunter College uh, to other students in CUNY, City University of New York. We also have students coming from outside of CUNY, say from, for example, Columbia University and other uh, universities, uh, students coming to our programs to take GIS courses. Um, on top of that, we have a whole series of GIS application courses. So for example, myself teach uh, urban applications of GIS, basically to show how, uh, how students and uh, professionals can use GIS in different settings, say for example, uh, urban, social, uh, political, environmental, uh, all kinds of settings. And through this kind of application course, we are able to interact with um, students from different backgrounds and also uh, uh, through research, we interact with other uh, scientists in computer science, in civil engineering, in psychology, in anthropology, and political science. And they may pursue more advanced teaching and research after they have done the basic uh, GIS courses, uh, certificate, and degree from our department. And I'll talk about uh, my research uh, more in the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hung Yun. Uh, Vince, please. Um. Oh, yes. can, you have, can you close your presentation for me so I can open mine? Uh, I believe Hung Yun, you need to close that on your end. Okay. okay. Post. Oh. Alrighty, so I thought I'd take a little bit different approach. And now again, working in the two-year college environment, one of the problems that you do run into is the fact that you have limited number of credit hours versus a bachelor's degree. While we may have 50 hours or 35 hours in the major area, you have very limited amount of general education in general. So one of the things that I've tried to do in my own geospatial classes and some of the ones that we've developed in the National Center is to bring real world approaches to it. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, but also, how do you bring interdisciplinary approaches into the certificate program that you might be doing as a two year college? And it could also work at a bachelor's level, I believe. So, for example, some of our battlefields that we can find historical maps. So, we can bring in a little bit of understanding of history. We're also teaching geo referencing and digitalization at the same time. So we combine these together and make them basically seamless uh, where they are put together. So there's one example. Um, with the UAS technology, 
this is really more about a change in the way we have to understand physics in camera optics. In the past, when we were doing remote sensing, a lot of times we were using Landsat data. Well, that data just came to us sort of out of a black box. Now that we can fly our own UASs, the students have to understand some of the parameters that they did not have to understand when they did Landsat type remote sensing. Demographics, we bring in the opinion of economics and business. If you're going to build a new restaurant, what do you have to know to be able to know where to put that new restaurant from a demographical standpoint? We try to bring enterprise systems enterprise IT in. Now, obviously, you can only scratch the surface of that when we talk about networking and web mapping. And finally, across the room, being a part of understanding project management. How you build something once and utilize it in other parts of other projects and things. So this automated task process, how that can improve project management abilities for people working on other projects from the one it was originally designed for. So these are some of the things that I've done on looking at other subject areas and trying to bring knowledge from other subject areas into the more traditional geospatial courses. I'll close that out. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you all uh, for uh, covering, you know, each of your interdisciplinary approach at your respective schools. Um, and a, this leads us into our uh, second topic at hand, uh, which is real-world application of geospatial technology. So what are what are those ex examples and experiences uh, that you can highlight at each of your schools? And I think we'll follow the same uh, the same uh, order uh, with Dr. Jane, Dr. Himyang, and then uh, uh, Vince Donato. So I'll let you all uh, proceed with that uh, process. OK. All right. So um, real-world applications of geospatial technologies, um, it's really important uh, when you're producing, you know, we're sending students off to, um, to the real world that they, they can actually work um, with GIS, work with their technology, whatever they are, um, and be able to um, actually um, conduct a real project. Um, and so one thing that we've done, and we've been doing it for quite some time now at Syracuse, is um, we have something called what we call our Syracuse Community Geography Program. And actually, I believe our community geographer is actually on um, in the audience here. Professor um, Janelle Robinson um, has been working as um, at the university as the Syracuse Community Geographer. And it, that position came about as a result of an introductory GIS class that I taught years ago um, when we um, hooked up with um, a local community-based organization, the Samaritan Center, um, because they wanted to understand hunger, um, sort of what hunger looked like in the city of Syracuse. And initially, they came in and said, we need a map. Um, and it turned into an entire semester class for um, um, 20 odd undergrads in the intro GIS class, and um, and it hit the newspapers. And but we had the students mapping uh, food stamps at the time, um, women, infant, and children recipients. We had them mapping where um, food bank the food bank is, um, the uh, food pantry, so on and so forth. Um, and at the end of that semester, not only have we done something really quite useful for the community, um, we've actually brought in a lot of community-based organizations, a lot of those organizations that work around that, the area of hunger and food insecurity. Um, and so we, we actually managed to bring a network of people together. Um, the students had done some learning. Um, they had to do some a lot of GIS, cranking of data, gathering of data, talking to people, um, and it worked incredibly well. And as a result of that, we decided, okay, let's see if we can get a community geographer. And so ever since then, we've had this program where our undergrads can go and um, they can apply to work on a project with the community geographer. Community organizations come to the community geographer um, and, and, and ask her to work on projects with them. 
Um, and so that way we're able to get all of our students, well, a lot of our students, um, out into the community doing real world um, work. Um, in some cases, they're not all actually going, you know, down into Syracuse, but they're working on real world data that they might be working on, um, you know, if they were out um, doing a job, you know, for some company. So Syracuse has been really um, sort of one of the leaders almost in community geography. There are other programs um, that are now doing this kind of community work. Um, and in fact, um, our community geographer has been around to many different places talking about our, the, the program. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about it, um, they can either go to the geography department webpage um, at Syracuse University and, and click on a link there on community geography, or there's also a link called communitygeography.org, um, and you can get a wealth of information about that program there. Um, but so that's one of the ways that we try to make sure that our students are just getting this sort of very real world um, use, um, a way, way to practice using um, their geospatial technologies. Um, in our other classes, we try, it, it's, it's a lot of work doing that. Um, if you get incorporated in a class, it does become, you know, it, it can be a lot of work for the professor. But um, it's, it's, it's incredibly useful for the students. The students always say that it, um, it's something that they really appreciate and they learn from. So um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. Um, but I guess I'll turn over to yeah, Hong Yun. Could you open my presentation? Please. So, um, um, as I said, we have a GIS a certificate program and a new master degree uh, program in GIS. Um, there are many um, uh, courses, GIS courses within those two GIS programs. Um, for example, there are a series of application course and I teach your urban applications of GIS. And so students will, um, uh, take uh, many lecture and then um, uh, lab uh, uh, course sections, class sessions, and then at the end of the class, they will be required to do uh, a real world project. So I have had students using GIS for all kinds of topics. For example, defining New York urban neighborhoods, finding the best location, for a, a restaurant or a, a, a fruit stand, and also for uh, preserving historical buildings. Um, so I have been teaching it for almost 20 years now, and there are many students doing all kinds of topics of application course. Other than that, um, we have other professors in the, in the, in the department that um, apply GIS in other fields, and other professors in other departments within uh, Hunter College or within CUNY are uh, using GIS for all kinds of applications as well. And so other than teaching courses, another way of teaching students and helping students learn is involve them um, in uh, research. And so, um, I'm going to show a series of uh, slides that um, briefly go through some of the research I have done, uh, basically uh, in collaboration with um, professors and professionals in uh, other disciplines, and also every time we have undergrad and graduate and PhD students involved. So one of the uh, real world application we do is we use the GPS and GIS to help uh, transportation planning. So what we do is we use the GPS information with the latitude and longitude and time and speed um, collected in GPS loggers and later on in smartphone. Uh, we try to uh, speculate and figure out uh, why they make the trip. Say, for example, are they commuting to work? or it's a social trip, or it's a shopping trip. And we are able to detect their travel modes. Say, for example, New York, uh, we have incorporated uh, walking, biking, subway, bus, 
uh, driving and then also ferry into the mode detection. And through the mode detection, we are able to figure out how people, without asking them, just use the GPS information collecting from the GPS loggers or smartphone to be able to tell by what transportation mode that they travel to work or travel to shop. And so uh, that also linked to the applications later on. And so we also uh, work with the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council uh, in using GPS loggers and uh, hopefully in the future use a smartphone to do travel survey, which is um, uh, something done in major metropolitan areas worldwide, uh, at least in New York, pretty much every 10 years, and they spend multi-million dollars in sending out paper questionnaires um, to ask people how they travel to work. Uh, with the GIS and GPS, we are able to figure that out to a great extent by just collecting the information without getting them to fill out any paper questionnaire. So this is uh, some of the work that we have uh, done so far. Oh, um, I don't know why I'm not. Okay, so for example, we build a multimodal network and we link all the commuter rail, bus routes and streets and subway lines and ferry lines together. And so we actually can figure out how people commute to work and quite often it involves more than one mode. So for example, quite typically people living in Long Island, um, they will drive they will actually drive to a, a, a parking lot and then maybe take the commuter rail and then maybe later on after they get into the city, take a subway and then they, they may even transfer to a bus before they reach their school or their workplace. And if you go on Google, Google only allows you to choose one major mode. But in reality, in a metropolitan uh, uh, speakers, areas as big as New York, there are all kinds of uh, uh, travel modes involved. And we build a multimodal transportation network that allow you to take all uh, several uh, transportation modes before you reaching your destination. And so that's um, a very useful database. And um, this is um, a table showing uh, how well we classify the travel mode or the mode detection when we are using GPS loggers many years ago. Now we use a smartphone and the accuracy has been substantially increased. And we also can um, put, um, uh, um, put in uh, what we call the volunteer geographic information of VGI on the web. And so basically uh, people can just create a name and password and upload their data into our web GIS. And then we activate, like if they activate the calculation, we'll detect their mode and show how they uh, commute to work or to school or how they travel by using the mode detection and trip purpose. And then they could go online and verify it or make changes uh, so that information is accurately uh, in store for transportation planning. Uh, so this is showing how uh, people can click and drag and, and change how the, uh, they are travel and change their mode to say, oh, I didn't take the uh, subway, I took the bus. And they could actually change it in the web GIS. And then later on, uh, we, we work with the computer scientist and we uh, put everything uh, in the Amazon cloud server using ArcGIS. So we are able to collect information from a smartphone through uh, apps in for Android phones and iPhones. And so the data just comes in into the cloud server. And then if they press a button that activates the algorithm and it will do the calculation and feedback information to the user and also store the information in the cloud server. And so the Amazon cloud server actually have the elastic load balancer that if it detects a lot of uh, uh, data coming, in, it just uh, 
uh, turn on uh, more than one cloud server to uh, process the information. But uh, if, uh, say, for example, you uh, there's no more um, data coming in and uh, not doing the survey or research or planning uh, 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 sessions, we could turn it off. And so the computer facility could be used by others. And we only pay for the time and the number of cloud servers in use. And so the federal government of the uh, United States have been encouraging us to use a cloud uh, server to um, uh, uh, share computing facilities and preserve uh, uh, computing facilities so that we are not uh, uh, having a computer server uh, in each institution that we use a, a computer uh, cloud server and only pay for it when we use it. And so this is showing how we may transfer the travel survey done in major metropolitan areas worldwide, including uh, New York City. And so we are able to combine the mobile technology, GIS, and the internet and the GPS for uh, uh, figuring out how people commute to work, which sometimes can create a lot of problems during the rush hour. And then this is showing how we use GPS and also um, later on we incorporated tweets from social media to figure out why and how people commute to work through the Twitter and through the apps in the smartphone. And uh, we have user interface uh, in the app and it goes through a map in G WebGIS and goes through a geo event processor uh, in um, uh, ArcGIS software and um, we could display the result on the web and it's all incorporated um, in the cloud computing and safe in the database. And so this is a very interdisciplinary approach. We uh, basically had the chance to work with the collaborators in other disciplines and students can interact with other um, uh, uh, professionals as well. Could you go back to my uh, presentation somehow? Oh, okay. So, um, so this is the um, uh, two of the applications. So when the user press a button, they could actually figure out the calorie burns uh, in their travel, the fat burned, and the carbon emission, and if they public, uh, if they walk or bike or take public transit. Uh, the carbon avoidance compared to driving alone, and how much uh, energy saved compared to uh, LIBO uh, lit. It. And also, um, we later on incorporated the social media um, uh, uh, tweets and Twitter into our uh, research. And basically, through their tweets, we are able to figure out partially why they travel. Are they going to a dream? Uh, a gym to exercise, are they going shopping, or are they going to work, or are they going to meet with the friends? And so this last slide uh, basically shows um, a GPS cluster team uh, we established, and uh, there are some uh, web links here, and then some of our publications in terms of uh, uh, passive travel survey collection and the travel mode detection, how to use GPS and GIS for job housing balance and transit oriented development and also establishing database and figuring out the origin destinations. And we, I also um, um, uh, chair and organize and co-chair for transportation symposiums in New York City uh, focusing how we could use GIS, GPS for urban transportation. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Vince. We went we went to your time there, but please uh, please provide your uh, uh, your insight on uh, some real world application. Can you get previous presentation closed, please. Okay. And I'll try to be relatively brief on this. Um, I just wanted to show how contextual case studies can be used anywhere from an intro class to 
you know, a higher level class. And so like for the venture capital study, the students are given a county and then they have to look at contiguous counties to that county to decide if they can open a restaurant. The biggest thing that students have problems with in this, they're so used to an education that everything must have a positive result that about two-thirds of the counties that we give them will give a null result or a negative result if they can be analyzed the demographical data with it. And students have a real trouble going back to their professor and saying, there's no place you can put a restaurant in this county. They have to just they have to come out with a positive result. Concept for the students to just be able to come back and say, no, you can't put a restaurant in this county with those parameters that you've given us. You know, understanding social issues such as sex offenders, access map the location of sex offenders, and understand the law, they come back and say, well, why are these people living out of compliance? Why isn't somebody checking on these people? And you can have an interest in what's going on there. You know, we look at today's world with all the improvement services. What was the improvement system like in 1900? So one of the projects we have is to digitize a sandboard map and figure out how much impervious surface was around in 1900, or actually 1906 in Louisville, Kentucky. So again, not just getting results. Um, field data collection, which was just alluded to a moment ago, you know, we've had students in urban heat island projects, historical markers, locating where they are at. Um, my favorite one is where are wineries located at? It gives me a place to go on weekends and things. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that we can do with field data collection by the general public, not having to be a geospatial expert. And the final one I'll mention just a moment about is creating final map documents without ever seeing the map, which really drives students crazy. But by using Python, they can create all the image maps they might need, all the PDFs they might need for an entire presentation without ever opening RTIS desktop. And this is an interesting learning experience for students to understand how can they do that with Python from the standpoint that they're used to being so visual as a learner, seeing something on the screen, yet they can see all the same So again, trying to make students think, but yet an interdisciplinary real world case study um, is what we're trying to do in my geospatial class here in Louisville. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you uh, all for uh, for sharing your uh, experiences with the real world application in the geospatial technology. I, we did have a couple of questions that came in uh, to specific educators uh, through our membership uh, that I wanted to just uh, uh, touch upon. Uh, the first question uh, for uh, Jane, uh, Dr. Jane Reed, uh, just general thoughts on geospatial technology and, and sort of where's where is it heading in the future? Uh, that was sort of a general question that they had. Was wondering if you had any, you know, uh, thoughts uh, on that. Uh, maybe a couple of minutes or so. Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I, yeah, I don't think geospatial technology is going to go away anytime soon. So what I think we're going to be seeing is just. Um, I, I think we're going to see continue to see these really rapid changes and developments in technologies. Um, the way that UAVs or drones have, you know, sudden, I mean, they've been around for a long time, um, but they, they've become um, more and more um, ubiquitous fairly, fairly, fairly quickly in recent years. And they are starting to change the way that we can think about um, gathering data, and in that case, then, that, that changes the way that the types of questions that we can ask, right? We can ask different questions because we're now able to answer them, them in a different way. Um, something like a UAV, which is having such a huge impact, um, you know, you can go out and you can gather exactly the data you want at exactly the time you want, of exactly the area that you want, um, and you can do it fairly inexpensively. Um, 
And so I think we're going to start to see more and more of those types of changes. I think we're going to see a lot more in the um, realm of um, artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, um, those kind of, um, and, uh, and, and as a result of that, I think we're going to start to see merging of um, um, different approaches. Um, so like my the storytelling class that I'm teaching, I'm not teaching it by myself, I'm teaching it with somebody who has a PhD in Russian literature. Um, we are trying, we're, we're able to use these technologies now to sort of merge um, these different approaches. I think it's becoming really, really rich, right? Um, we, talk, we talk about storytelling and all the different technologies that you can bring to bear, at, but bringing all these different approaches at the same time. And it, it helps you can just do some really cool stuff with it all. Um, so, you know, that's one example. So I think that um, in terms of where it's going, I think we, it's, it's already pretty much in everybody's hands to be able to make a map. Um, my fear is that um, with, with so many people able to create maps, um, the, the, there's that sort of um, the underlying principles on, on which all of those maps lie are, are hidden, and I think, and that's okay. That's not a problem. But the technologies that have to go in to develop that to make it seamless for somebody who doesn't necessarily understand the projections or scale issues. Um, I think those technologies have to be, they're, they're very sophisticated, they have, have a lot of um, um, those principles worked into them. And so I don't think that um, we're going to be losing geographers or geospatial um, experts anytime soon. I think we're going to be needing more and more and more of them um, and being able to deal with larger and larger data sets. Time. Excellent. That, Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, and I'll open that up also to Vincent Hung Yun. Uh, if you would like to uh, chime in on that, uh, one to two minutes. Okay. Um, from my standpoint, I'm seeing a lot of people who are doing geospatial technology who don't have the educational background necessarily in geospatial technology. For example, they might have been trained as an environmental biologist. That they spend half their time in state government working and doing space technology, and they've only had one or two classes in geospace. And I see a lot of people working outside the field that they were necessarily specifically trained in, but instead doing another field but don't have a formal education in it. And I think that's one of the reasons that we find a lot of the workshops that we do at the Geotech Center so very popular. Because we have people who are teaching in the subject, who are working in the subject without the formal methodology. Um, I would say about half of the students I have at the two-year college level already have um, degrees in other areas, bachelor's degrees in other areas, and coming back to get a formalized um, education in geospatial technology. Thank you, Vince. And Dr. Hung Miao, would you like to uh, add anything to that discussion? Yeah, um, I think, um, uh, uh, first of all, Winston has a very good point. Um, so uh, professionals, they do need the basic uh, GIS uh, education in order to be able to apply GIS uh, correctly in the real world situation. And also, Jane's, uh, Jane has a very good point that when we are able to um, use the GIS, for the uh, goods of the society, um, then uh, definitely the geospatial technology is going to expand and become popular and we'll have more uh, uh, students uh, uh, taking GIS classes. So um, Jean mentioned uh, the artificial intelligence connection and um, I want to point out that in the past, uh, quite often we say, for example, uh, act, uh, press a button in the app and activate an algorithm to do the calculation. But now we are able to use artificial intelligence. Say, for example, in our recent project, uh, we um, classify the trips and, and see how people, why they travel, because of work, because of entertainment, right? Um, and then once we have accumulated many trips and classifications, 
actually we can use artificial intelligence to automatically classify future tweets into different categories and figure out why people commute to work, uh, like uh, why they travel, either commute to work, school or shopping. And so if we are able to incorporate the uh, popular um, expanding technologies into our geo geospatial technology, we are going to uh, definitely become more popular. And in terms of technology, say for example, computer science, they are, their student number is exploding. And if we could combine with uh, computer science, to establish some courses and programs, that would definitely increase the enrollment into geography and other disciplines as well. Excellent, thank you. And uh, we have we have a few more minutes. Uh, don't see any questions in the chat box, but I did have another question. Uh, this one was directed to uh, Vince, but you know certainly would love the, the input of everyone else. Uh, so about one to two minutes, Vince, uh, what are some of your collaborative experience uh, working with other educators within the geospatial technology field? Hmm. Interesting. Um, Probably the biggest thing is a misconception and a misunderstanding of what geospatial technology is. Um, you know, for example, working with the IT folks, they just assume that what we're doing in geospatial is completely out of the realm of anything that they're teaching in traditional information technology that they're used to. But yet we're working with things like networks, we're working with SQL servers, you know, we're working with um, wireless communication technology, and they don't see the relationship in other technologies that I'm finding of what we are doing. They see this as a black box out there, not part of anything in a lot of ways, because you know, some geography departments don't claim it across the country, some IT departments don't claim it across the country, a real not understanding where things fit. I guess it's the best way I can put it. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, that, excellent. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Dr. Jane, Dr. Hung Yan, who, any uh, one of you would like to chime in? Yeah, um, I um, I work with uh, other educators in other in other disciplines. Say, for example, um, the computer science department at Hunter College and also City College. Uh, so, for example, there's a professor in the computer science department. Um, they uh, uh, teach a course, uh, basically uh, teaching students how to make an app uh, for the smartphone. And so. Um, uh, quite often they use the uh, uh, GIS, GPS, latitude uh, accelerometer data. And so um, in our geography department, we, we tend to not to teach computer programming. But if we have professors in computer science teaching uh, programming, and then we combine the programming uh, with the, the geospatial technology, then students will be able to learn more with this interdisciplinary approach, and they are uh, they can have a broader job market when they graduate. And I also work with the uh, civil engineers as well because you no know, transportation gets so much funding, and there's such a broad uh, job market in transportation that um, there are a lot of funding and job uh, opportunities available. Uh, for students coming out from those joint projects or joint courses. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jane uh, Reed, would you like to uh, mention anything? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't really have anything new to add. I mean, we did, a lot of what we do is in, interdisciplinary. Um, we, when I first got to SU, a lot of um, different people from different colleges would reach out because they were so excited that GIS was you know, there was a new person doing GIS. Um, and so, you know, and I've, I've co-taught the UAV course. I co-taught with somebody from Earth Sciences. The spatial storytelling, I co-taught with somebody um, from, um, actually, she was from the provost's office, um, an education specialist. Um, and so, you know, we have, you know, if, if you're going to find these co courses, and they're hard to co-teach across colleges, because oftentimes, you know, how do you count that? Um, 
the um, but GIS seems to be able to do it, and so and we, we do get a lot more um, communication between colleges based on the geospatial. And the iSchool, we're about to launch hopefully um, some new programs with the iSchool. So um, yeah, it, it works really, really well. One thing I would add to this is, um, and, and both of what what everybody's been saying and uh, brought this to mind is that it's really difficult, it seems, for geographers or geospatial scientists to explain to other disciplines um, why it's special. That whole idea that spatial is special, um, it, it, it's hard, that hard for us to be able to explain across the board. How do our students explain it to potential employers? And I think that one of the things we're constantly trying to do is explain to our students why it's really important and why they're valuable, why this idea of geospatial technology, it makes them incredibly useful. But, it, but explaining that and being able to sell themselves um, to employers, it, it's hard because a lot of people don't understand it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And, and with that, uh, I want to just thank everyone again. I want to thank our panel um, speakers uh, for their time. Uh, for their efforts, for their uh, experiences that they just shared, uh, and everything um, uh, above that. And I, I want to thank all the attendees. Uh, this is uh, this webinar uh, has been recorded. We will share the links uh, with subsequent emails. This will be posted. Uh, for Vince and uh, Hangmian, if you'd like to share a presentation with me, we're more than happy to put that on the webinar uh, page on our professional development. And uh, Jane, if there's anything you'd like to share as well, any documents, uh, anything, uh, please feel free to send that. Uh, and with that, you know, I want to thank you again um, on behalf of the New York State GI Association. Um, and uh, I wish uh, you, you all the best uh, with the current.